So we're going to start with a video about Peter Brown. I think Ian has given us a, a very excellent introduction to the, the broad uh, problems that face us in magnetosphere, magnetosphere coupling, uh, ionosphere now being a word we don't mention except to people who've measured it for years. I'd like to show uh, in the first slide, <laughs> it works if you just press down. Uh, this is a bit of a problem seeing the slide from this angle. Uh, a, a view essentially which is uh, of our own ignorance of what's going on rather than what we know. Uh, much of what's there is incorrect. Uh, it's smooth because we don't have the measurements to give us the detail which uh, would illustrate the true physical processes. Uh, this is a slide that uh, Ian and I cooked up several years ago. Uh, there are many things that now go on in this particular slide that uh, aren't indicated there. With respect to thermoplasma, which we're concerned with here, uh, we're talking about plasma with energies between perhaps a hundredth of an EV going up to perhaps five electron volts. And we know that uh, we have three general regions uh, where thermoplasma uh, is found, I easily found. Uh, we have the plasmosphere region in here, which is surrounded by ring current. Uh, perhaps this should have been rotated around out of the plane of the slide. We have a, a trough region, which uh, it probably exists just to the equatorward edge of the plasma sheet, uh, the plasma sheet possibly being the uh, projection of the uh, diffuse aurora. Discrete aurora occurring on the high latitude side of the plasma sheet. And then we have the large uh, polar cap region where we have a, an absence of plasma, uh, presumably because we have these outflows that Ian was referring to uh, along these long field lines which may connect out to this or in some way uh, essentially exhaust the plasma that's uh, stored there. We have a number of, of different problems uh, that are uh, hidden by a nice uh, neat schematic like this. Uh, for instance, we have to ask what is the distribution of ionization along the magnetic field lines, looking down like that. We really have no idea. We know what it looks like up to about 3,000 kilometers, that is at the lowest parts in here, and we know that when you fly a satellite across it, you see a very sharp density discontinuity, the plasma pause, but we really don't know how it's adjusting itself along the magnetic field line in response to pressure gradients, uh, gravity, which is uh, just relatively unimportant. It just isn't isn't something you really need to do and put in theoretical studies. Uh, we may have parallel electric fields induced by uh, ring current protons with uh, anisotropic uh, pitch angle distributions. We don't know if the thermal plasma can actually penetrate through those particles efficiently. This may affect some of the things that uh, Richard Thorne will talk about later. Now the applications of all of this are uh, a bit more complicated. The di uh, global distribution of thermal plasma depends very crucially on the a global pattern, time-dependent pattern of uh, global electric fields. Uh, in this uh, context, one could say that the distribution of thermal plasma is a secondary effect of a primary cause, the primary cause being the, the electric fields that are set up uh, throughout the magnetosphere. In any case, uh, there is certainly the possibility of loss of plasma. Uh, one continually sees at high latitudes uh, all the way down uh, fr from what we term here an inner plasmosphere and an outer plasmosphere. In all of these regions out in here, one finds an outflow of plasma. That does depend on local time. It's a, a complicated topic, but much of this is uh, uh, certainly indicative, as Ian pointed out, that uh, the, the, these protons are being lost out of the magnetosphere. They're not reappearing at some other local time sector and being pushed back in. At least the area where that could happen is getting smaller and smaller. It must look like if it really is happening, that they're coming back into the atmosphere, it must be a very small location that we haven't found yet. And it's easier to believe right now that they're just uh, going away from the magnetosphere continually. And Ian has pointed out that the, this affects the, the helium budget in a very crucial way. Uh, what we're trying to indicate here are, again, the three different regions, the high latitude polar uh, wind regions where you have what appears to be, from observational evidence, a, a fairly continuous outflow of plasma going out like this. Uh, you have the plasma trough region in here where the field lines uh, uh, appear to be closed, although they may be open at times. Uh, you have a theoretical problem, which has to be resolved, of what happens when you have these colliding beams of plasma coming out of opposite hemispheres. Do they set up shock fronts? Is it just a big amorphous blob of plasma that accumulates there and sort of moves back down the field line as this whole convection pattern rotates around the Earth? It's uh, very difficult to know. You have the same sequence uh, inside here, uh, and I'd like to draw a distinction between the inner plasmosphere and outer plasmosphere in the sense that 
we know that there are very strong impulses of uh, westward electric field which drive plasma inwards on the night side. And when this happens, much of the plasma that's stored along the magnetic uh, flux tube is jammed down into the ionosphere. Uh, it does this. If you look at the total velocity of the plasma, of course, you have a parallel component and you have a perpendicular component. So you get velocity vectors which sort of point in towards the equatorial regions. It's a, a region which is uh, a topic of actually computing what the temperature and density uh, is when you have these very impulsive fields uh, associated with substorms. It's uh, a very interesting topic and a number of people working on it right now. I think that uh, brings us fairly well up to date on, on what we, we think we know. Theory uh, certainly is ahead of experiment in this particular area. And uh, it's no wonder, uh, if you look back in the papers of 1960 uh, IGY period, the thermal plasma had the same, the same general characteristic of the ether of special relativity. Uh, that is, that it was always postulated to be there, but you didn't know much about it. But whereas the ether has been proven not to exist in some people's minds, at least we know we do have some thermal plasma sitting out there. Okay. So, uh, the, very good. Um, Bob Schunk is going to say a couple of words uh, reflecting on that philosophical remark, I think. And then uh, we'll roll right into his invited uh, presentation on Magnus Granitzer coupling past, present, and future. So get Bob hooked up. Um, I, was a po I got my PhD in 1970 at Yale, working in physics of fluids and plasmas. And when the polar wind was produced, and Banks and Holzer had their papers out, and Ian was talking about the polar wind, I got really excited. So fortunately, Peter Banks offered me a postdoctoral position in 1972. And I arrived in January 1970. Uh, three to work with him and it was a really incredible opportunity at UCSD at that time. Peter is my main mentor and he's been very valuable in shaping my career. Uh, Joe Duknick was also very valuable. Joe just became an expert on the incoherent scatterator facility at Chattanooga and I had an ionospheric model and so we would get the data and Peter and I and Joe would sit down and look at all this new exciting data and trying to speculate how it would work and how it would affect the ionosphere and the thermosphere, and that was exciting. And I was developing new models with Peter on the polar wind. So both Peter and Joe were very instrumental. Uh, Joe in particular, he, uh, we had computers back then that are not anywhere near as good as what we have now. And Joe would be an expert on a computer, so whenever I had problems with the code, I would go to Joe. And those were the good old days when you used Fortran 4. I think some of you remember that. I'm still using it because Joe taught me how to do it and um, it still works just fine. But it was an unbelievable opportunity. Ian Axford was there, Jules Fayer, um, Alvain was there. And that was a surprise to me too because they had an Alvain seminar series every week in the winter and Alvain would come to his own seminar series. And I thought you had to be dead to have a seminar series. So <laughs> I was a little, you know, taken aback. but. Alvain was the type of person that he, you know, the speaker would start talking and Alvain would interrupt them immediately, ask questions, and I divert him to a, divert him to a totally different topic. And we'd start out with 30, 35 people, and at the end of it, there would be me, another postdoc, Alvain, and the speaker. <laughs> so again, this was new to me. I was learning a lot at that time. Henry Booker was there. And then um, Andy Nagy came for a one-year sabbatical. At the same time, John Reid came in from England for a one-year sabbatical. Oscar Brecker was there at the time as well. And uh, again, working on the Incoherent Scatter Radar Facility with Joe. And then Rick Chappell came in for a sabbatical. And then after about five or six months, um, he actually got a real job at Lockheed. And so, but still it was nice having Rick there. And Jim Horowitz was a student at the time. So we would get together, Peter would schedule opportunities Every weekend, there'd be, we'd be on the beach in the summer uh, at, on a Friday night or Saturday night. And occasionally, he would schedule trips into the desert to go camping. Now, growing up in New York City, I thought a Motel 6 was camping. <laughs> and so I never actually went into the desert to go camping because I couldn't see how they could get the running water and the toilets out there. So I, didn't, I never did any of that. But, but they told me it was good, it was nice, you know, so. And then in, um, 
Three years later, in 1976, Peter Banks became head of the physics department at Utah State University, and he went there, and then uh, Joe Duknick and I went with him, and uh, Joe went into the double E department, and I went into the physics department, and shortly after that, uh, John Forster came, Dyke Stiles, John Pierre St. Maurice, then John Ray relocated from England and became a permanent Utah resident, um, and then Jan Soika came. So if you look back, and you can trace all of that activity to Peter Banks, and so really Peter Banks had a major impact on not just my career, but a lot of people's careers. And um, I wanted to get a picture of Peter when he was younger, but we, show, we saw the video. Uh, so this looks like Peter now. You haven't changed really very much, Peter. But um, I asked Shauna if she could get me a picture of Joe, and I guess she never did, because I don't know who this is. Uh, it might have been one of Joe's students. I'm, I'm not quite sure. But at any rate, it was truly an exciting time because they had Inco and Scatterator facilities. The Inco and Scatterator facility, Chattanooga operating in, a, in Alaska. We had access to the new data. And then we had, I was developing new models for the polar wind, which was also exciting. And um, I'll give you a hint as to what I'm going to talk about today. The initials are PW for polar wind. So with that, you can, um, I'm on the clock now.